Hey everyone, so um, I'm coming live today to tell you a little bit about Peter and the Wolf, um, how I teach Peter and the Wolf, some tips and tricks, things that I've come across in my time teaching it, um, and to share some resources with you about Peter and the Wolf. Um, if you don't know who I am, I don't know how that's possible if you're watching my live video. I feel like you have to like my page to do that, but just in case, uh, my name is David Rao, and I'm the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org, and I have a uh, presence here on Facebook where I share ideas and things, and I'm on Pinterest and Twitter and whatever. But um, I'm here today to talk to you about Peter and the Wolf. So, uh, Peter and the Wolf, when I first started teaching, I really liked the idea of Peter and the Wolf. I really liked the content, but I did not know what I was doing. I felt like I was not very successful at it. Maybe you have felt the same way. Um, and so as I've done it over the years, I feel like I've gotten a little bit better at it, and I feel like I've come across some things that have been sort of helpful, and I wanted to share uh, those with you. If you're somebody who feels like maybe you're doing it wrong, probably you're not. Probably you're doing a fine job. But just in case you want a couple more tricks um, to have up your sleeve, here are just a few ideas. First of all, when I teach Peter and the Wolf, I teach it to first grade. And I know some people don't do that. Some people do second grade or third grade or later. Some people do as early as kindergarten. I don't do that. Um, I teach first grade, and um, my goals for first grade, um, I want to give them some exposure. So um, exposure to listening, to spending time listening and knowing, training your body and training your ears to listen so that they can sort of get more used to that. Um, I want them to hear instruments, and I want them to hear what different instruments sound like because those timbres are so important. Um, just giving them exposure to things is a big deal. I learned that when I first taught um, a couple opera pieces to kids. They laughed, and I was like, this is not weird. <laughs> but they, it was to them. They just never heard it. So exposure early on to orchestral instruments is a great thing, and Peter and the Wolf is an awesome way to do that. Um, and then I also teach... Peter and the Wolf for the motives of Peter and the Wolf. I teach it for each character and the song that they sing. Um, so I do that on purpose um, because I want them to get those sounds in their ears and I want them to um, sort of start associating that a character can have a theme, it can have a motive with it. What I do not teach it for, I do not teach Peter and the Wolf for timbre. I am not teaching this for them to hear the difference between a clarinet and an oboe. Because, again, I'm doing this with first grade, and I feel like it's very early in their career for them to be able to, to make those, you know, connections or, or to make those uh, differentiations between something so similar in timbre. I am not doing it for them to just hear the timbre so that later I could say, like, oh, I'm going to play a, an instrument sound, and you tell me what it is. That's not what this is. Um, but it is for listening, and it is um, so that they get better at, learning to listen, sitting more time, spending more time sitting, spending more time actively listening, as opposed to a lot of the listening they may do on their own at home or in the car or whatever. So um, let me show you just a couple resources before I show you how I teach this, um, because the resources have definitely helped me. The first year, I think I just tried to sit down with a recording and I was like, it was the worst idea I ever had. And I'm pretty sure the next day I was like, nope, I'm going to try that differently. So um, Books. I have a book. I really like um, the books that I have. Um, I the, the book that I love the most, and there are so many books. I looked on Amazon just a minute ago, and there are so many books that could work for Peter and the Wolf. I'm not saying there is one better than another, but the book I have is better than all the others. Just kidding. I just like my book for a lot of reasons. First of all, it's big, and I'm sorry. It's going to be backwards because my phone is backwards. I'm really sorry. Um, but it actually does say Peter and the Wolf the right way, not backwards. So I like it because it's really big. So when I'm showing this to students, they can see the pictures a little bit more easily. Um, I also like it because the sort of the, the style of the book is that they start it as if you're in a, in a theater, like watching a live performance, which so many of my kids have never done. And so this is sort of a cool way for them to see, like the curtain opens and there's an orchestra and there's a conductor. And so this is sort of a fun way to lead them into that, especially... If you're a school that, like, takes them to a live performance, what a great primer this would be. Um, but anyway, this is the book I have. It's by uh, Jörg Müller. Um, I looked at It's very old. You actually can get it on Amazon. It's J umlaut O R G M U U umlaut L L E R, and I'll, I'll put this on the comments later. Um, when I look at the publishing date, it says that it was published and um, it was printed in West Germany. So it's old, 
but it's very good. Um, and I love it because I think the pictures are sort of fun and the pictures are a little bit more realistic than they are cartoony. And I like that. Um, so this is the book that I use. You can absolutely get this on Amazon and other places, but buy it used. Don't buy it new. I think if you buy it new, it's like $90. Don't do that. Or just look online. You can probably find it. Um, so that's the book I use. I also have this book, which is a Walt Disney book, and this goes along with the resource I'll tell you about later. But this one, see the pictures, hear the tape, read the book. Well, I don't have the tape, but um, I, I also have this book so that I can go back later if I want. And this is a Disney cartoon. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Um, the recording I use, I was looking through my resources and I have a Carnival of the Animals recording that, guess what, also has Peter and the Wolf and it also has... The Mother Goose Suite by Ravel. Probably you, you might say like, oh, I don't think I have a recording. Check your CDs because a lot of times you'll have Carnival of the Animals and Peter and the Wolf or Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra and Peter and the Wolf. A lot of times um, they're combined into one CD. So I have this. This isn't even the one I used, but I was just looking to see like, hey, I wonder if I have a hard copy. Yeah, I do. Um, how I use this is I actually get on my phone in school, and um, I stream this. I get on Spotify, and I look up, here, I think I can show you. I look up, uh, a great shot of my face, I'm so proud. Okay, so I look, and I find this. It's Peter and the Wolf, and it is done by, uh, well, it's narrated by David Bowie, which is awesome, and I think it's the Philadelphia Orchestra. You can get this for free on Spotify. Um, you don't, students don't have to see the banner ads or anything else like that. You can put, use it on your phone. Um, if you're doing the, the free version, I will say that sometimes Spotify will dump in a commercial after every four or five tracks. So just be careful of that. Um, if you have the paid version of Spotify, you're not going to get those commercials, which is awesome. But I just love this version, and I hope you can hear it. I'm going to turn it up because David Bowie is a great narrator. This is the story of Peter and the Wolf. Each character in this tale is going to be represented by a different instrument of the orchestra. Now, there are sometimes later on when David Bowie's accent the way that I, or, or a way that I would not say them, and I sort of have to correct him, but I just love his narration of it, so I think it's super great. The Philadelphia Orchestra does an awesome job, um, and so it's a 1989 recording. It's totally worth it. I think it's the best one out there, but you, you know, you make your own decision. So I have my book, and I have my music. Um, if if I can, if I'm in my room, I like to put the, the book underneath the document camera. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Just so that it's bigger up on the screen so kids can see bigger. Because even though this is a big book, each page is sort of segmented. And so they show different things all at once. And then I find a couple problems with that. It's not as easy to see, even though it is big. And the other reason is that in some instances... If you just flip the page, kids are going to see things that are ahead of your recording, and you maybe don't want them to do that. So I like to use my document camera, and my trick is that I, I put the picture underneath the document camera, and then I hit freeze on the dot cam. So then I can move the book around or flip to the next page or mess around with my iPod um, or my phone or whatever, and I don't have to worry about what they're seeing because it's frozen. And then when I'm ready to move on, I reorient the book, I unfreeze it and freeze it again so they can see that next thing. Um, I, I think you could go to your copier at your school and scan a PDF of a book. I think you can do that. I'm also pretty sure that's illegal. So I can't tell you to do that. But I think you could also scan pictures from your book, and then you could cut them up and crop them or whatever and put them in a PowerPoint. Again, I can't tell you to do that because I'm pretty sure that breaks copyright. But I think that that's, you're, you're, that's a capability. You might be able to do that if you want it. So, again, I use my dot cam, and I love it because then I can sort of freeze and show them what I want when I want. Um, if I am doing it in person, that's what I did this year because I didn't have a document camera in the room I was teaching in. Um, I just held the book. And um, I, there were times where uh, it was sort of hilarious. Like I was holding it and I would hold it very strategically. So like my arm would cover up things. So, and then I'd point to what I really want them to see. And there was one section of first graders who was like, Mr. Rao, Mr. Rao, can you move your arm please? Because there is a picture I'd like to see. I was like, that's so very nice of you, but just wait a moment. Um, 
And so it, it works. There's There are ways that you could cover up what you don't want to see. Maybe your book only has one picture per page, and you're blessed, and you don't need to worry about it. So um, those are the resources I use. My book, my recording, like I said, I have it on my phone. I have the paid version of Spotify. It's 10 bucks, so I don't have the ads. Um, but I had that before Peter and the Wolf. I didn't just do that for Peter and the Wolf. Um, and then I, I play it and I go through and I go through sort of scene by scene. Um, and if you've listened to Peter and the Wolf with students, you know, there are moments that are like terrifying as a teacher because it's just playing the music and there's no narration and there's no follow up. And maybe you're just holding a picture and you're like, dear Lord, there's a minute of this music. What do I do? You know, because like, oh, keep watching, keep watching the page that's not turning. Keep watching, keep listening. That doesn't work for me. And so, so in those lulls, in those moments, I start asking them guided listening questions. I say things like, man, do you hear this song? You know, like, do you hear, how does this sound? Oh, does this, who, if you know who, which character this song belongs to, raise your hand. Oh, that's so great. Put your hand down. Or, um, you know, because, because Peter and the Wolf opens with each character introduced um, or introducing each character and their theme, um, it's easy to sort of in that moment to really talk about the theme so then later you can go through and say, huh, which character is this? And without actually telling them or pointing to it, you can sort of ask them in those moments where the music is just going. You can say, hmm, this sounds interesting. Or you might say, huh is it sounding happy anymore? It was happy a minute ago. What does it sound like now? And start asking questions. Maybe not questions that you actually want them to answer. So you might say like, hmm, if you think this is a happy song or a scary song, you know, happy song, put your hand on your chest. A scary song, put your hand on your head or whatever. There, there are ways that you can ask those guided listening questions to keep them involved and keep them interested, but then also not just have them sitting there. Because to ask a first grader to sit for, you know, 45 minutes without you know, some sort of moving or, or getting upset or whatever, that's not realistic. So again, with my first graders, I ask them some of these guided listening questions. Um, so here, let me give you an example of that. So when I first go through the book um, and it introduces each character and it introduces each of their songs, because in the, in the recording, it does that. Uh, let me see if I can cue that up. So there's grandfather and then the narrator will will tell you and it'll tell you who plays it and then it plays it when I first initially go through these characters I give them a little bit more character if that makes sense so when we introduce the bird I say "Ooh, do you hear how fast the bird is moving that bird must have fly up in the sky that's why she's so high up in the range because she's moving fast and fast and fast and do -do 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 -do. and I sort of talk through that and as we move on I give each each character something specific for the kids to listen to so that later in those moments where the music goes on for a minute and a half without narration that you don't have to freak out because they're still listening so the bird I say oh fast moving and quick and high and then the duck I say oh the duck has such a whiny song -na 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 -na. Um, please freeze frame me doing that terrible face and uh, post it on here um, so the duck is whiny the cat ooh, is sneaking I am sneaking through the grass I'm going to eat that bird and I give them these ideas of like what they're hearing giving character to the sound or the style grandfather is is grumpy but um but um but um bum 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 I know this rendition rendition is just completely perfect um the wolf when we get to the wolf I say do you think this is a happy wolf or an angry wolf and they're like it's an angry wolf um and so I can do like da na 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 and they sort of learn that character and Peter I always say this reminds me of a playground song he's just so happy he's bouncing along bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, ba. and I, I do a little dance my little thing along with it and they sort of do that along too so then when they hear Peter they associate that thing so then again later in, in the lulls I can reference back and say huh what whose song is this it sounds pretty whiny hmm who could that be and then they sort of start to think a little bit more the character that's the most troublesome for me is the hunters um, and the, the reason for that is because they have guns, they have shotguns and who wants to reference that in school? Nobody. Um, and so I say, well, they're hunters. They're doing it to stay safe because they're hunting a wolf and a wolf can be a dangerous animal. So they're being very careful with their guns. Or I don't even go into that and I say, Ooh, listen to the drums. And I make it more about the drums than I talk about the kettle drums or whatever. 
Sorry, Mandy, I didn't realize you commented. I do it with first grade. Sometimes second. Um, at this school, they didn't get it in first grade, so I'm doing it first and second so that they get that experience. So then I go through and, you know, I go scene by scene and we, we listen to Peter. And again, let me give you an example of one of the things that I might do. So like when they introduce the bird the first time, the first instance of it is great because it goes and the kids get that. And then it gets to all is quiet and they have this long <laughs> interlude. And so let me play it for you. I think I can get it here. On a branch. So there's the bird. So it's this really long, slow sort of thing that is supposed to be very quiet. So I start asking like, huh, whose song is that? And, they can, and then I do my little action and they can tell that it's Peter. And in this instance, I can say, you know what? I think I hear something else. I think I hear something high and fast moving quickly. Who could that be? And they're like, it's the bird. And I say, great. Uh, we can do Peter's dance, but when you hear the bird, raise your hand. Don't say it, just raise your hand. So then we're doing our thing. And they're listening along. And then when you hear a flute, then you have them raise their hand. That's just one way that I can have them sort of be involved even when there's just music playing with no narration. Because they, they yearn for that narration and so do we because we're like, please get me through this, keep them engaged. Um, same thing with um, later in, in, the, in the story, at the very, very end of the story when they're going to the zoo or going to release the wolf or whatever it is your storybook says. There's a part where grandfather and the cat are together. And so I could say, ooh, raise your hat, hand when you hear the cat or whatever, just so you can sort of help them sort of identify those motives. So I go through, um, <clears throat> through the story, and it's a little bit slow to start. Um, and then we get to the cat, oh, that sneaky cat trying to eat the birds, and the birds yell at him and whatever. Um, and whenever there's a part where the duck goes, whack, 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 and I make a duck sound so that they can sort of associate the instrument that's doing it with what the duck would actually be doing. Um, then grandfather comes out. I'm sure you know the story. Grandfather comes out and he says, well, what would you do if the wolf came out? You're being so irresponsible and takes Peter back into the house and locks the gate. And so then, of course, what happens as soon as grandfather and Peter are gone? Well, the wolf shows up. So when I get to this, you know, this is the end of grandfather taking Peter inside and he goes back to sleep. And I say something like, mm, who do you think is looking out of, out of the forest right now? Oh, it's the wolf. They get it. So when the wolf shows up, um, the wolf scares the animals, um, and the cat runs up the tree. And before, when the duck was angry at the bird, he jumps into the pond, and I make sure to say, like, oh, into the pond. That's a safe place to be. So when the wolf comes out, and it says, and the wolf jumped out of the pond, I, I re respond to the kids. I'm like, he jumped out of the pond, but that's not a safe place to be. And then, of course, the wolf chases the duck, and... The wolf eats the duck, and then you hear the wolf's angry theme again. And then, at that moment, I, every year never fails. I have little first grade girls go, <gasps> and they, like, grab their neighbor's hand. Like, literally every year. And it is the cutest thing, and I try not to <laughs> make a big deal out of it. Um, but the, the wolf eats the duck, and that's where I stop on day one. So day one, I do a little, like, a game, like a little tiny five-minute song or game or something to get them started, to sort of get them calmed down. You're in music now, blah, blah, blah. We go to our reading center. We start the book. We can make it all the way to the wolf eating the duck in the first day. I have 30-minute I have classes, so that's doable. So then once the wolf eats the duck, I say, oh, no, well, I wonder what's going to happen next time because here's the wolf looking up the tree at P or at at the cat and the bird and whatever. And so we stop and we move on. We line up and we leave. The next day when they show up, I do it again. I do a little game, a little welcome game or welcome song or whatever. Um, we take a few minutes review. Then we get back to our reading center. And I review all the characters. I go back to the beginning. Um, I, t I show them the pictures from the beginning again. And I, I go through. I say, oh, and then here's, here's this character. And I um, sometimes, like this year, I even said, like, here are four characters. I'm going to sing one of their songs, and raise your hand if you know who it is. And I don't start with the bird. I start with someone else. And I do my terrible sung version of that theme, and they raise their hand and figure out who it is. Um, but I go over these for sure, because I want them, again, to remember who it is so that they can identify it later. The other thing that I do in, in my version, I don't know about all the Peters, but 
um, all the recordings of Peter, they don't really introduce the actual singing of the hunters. They only do the drums for the, the guns, and I sort of hate that. So I say, I have a new character I'm going to sing, and I sing the theme. Ba-dum, bum, bum, ba-dum, bum, bum. And I say, you know what? I think I hear a steady beat in there. Can you do a little bounce to the steady beat? Ba-dum, bum, bum, ba-dum, bum, bum. And I go through their theme. So then they're sort of, even though they haven't actually heard this yet, then they sort of know what's coming. So then we go back, and I say, and I could just go through the story. Oh, Peter's out, and his friend the bird, and then the friend the duck, and I go through all of that, and I say, and then the wolf ate the duck, and that's where we're going to start. And so we go from there. Um, <clears throat> we were, we um, go scene by scene, basically to the end. And honestly, there's not a lot left in the story. So Peter comes out. Oh, I'm not on the right page. Peter comes out, and he gets over the fence, and he catches the wolf. Um, he lets the, the bird distracts the wolf and Peter lets down a rope to, to get her on the wolf's tail. It's a little bit dicey with the story because, well, when Peter's up and he gets the lasso around the wolf's tail, which is sort of in this area, as soon as he gets the wolf, I say, oh no, but Peter, you need to do something smart because what if the wolf pulls him off of the tree, even though he's caught, what is he going to do, Peter? And so then I, um, then Peter ties the, the rope on the branch it still doesn't make a lot of sense because the wolf is tied to a tree, but they haven't like trapped him. He's not, well, he's still a wolf, but somehow then the hunters show up and Peter's like, don't worry, I've caught the wolf. And I was like, well, you've caught the wolf, but he has not turned into like a docile basset hound at this point. So like, he, I just don't go over that with students, but the wolf like somehow calms down or gets so tired pulling on the rope that he's fine. Now he's a nice wolf. I don't know. So in the version, um, in the book version I have, uh, Peter says, let's take him back to the forest. In the David Bowie version, he says, let's take him to the zoo. Um, and so whatever you have, it's sort of a, a fun next step. I like the zoo. I like that that's where they're taking him. Um, and then they go through and they have each character. This seems to take a long time for me, the procession to the forest or the procession to the zoo. Um, and so, again, I go over like, ooh, whose song is this? And we go through each one. And I say, listen for... Whatever. And this is the point where grandfather's carrying the cat and they sort of do things together. Um, there are other moments like that when Peter says, hey, bird, go distract the wolf. You hear Peter's song and the bird's song. And so, again, I try and I have kids identify that moment. Um, and so then I, we go all the way to the end. At the very end of this book, I love the ending for this book because, again, it goes back to the theater. And so it shows all the characters come out. And I say, like, if you went to an actual theater... At the end of a, a show, you would clap. You would clap for the performers, and the performers would come out and bow, and sometimes if they do a really great job, you give them flowers, and so here they have flowers, and I point out grandfather's holding flowers, and the wolf has flowers in his mouth, and on the back of the wolf is the cat, and on the cat's back is the duck. Oh, the duck must be okay. That's so wonderful. And the bird, and then, oh, the hunters have flowers in their shotgun, and, um, and in the back of the book, there's Peter and the wolf. It resolves pretty well. Um, and so when the, when the duck shows back up, I have less kids like, but the duck got eaten. I was like, well, it's a play. They're pretending. So, um, that sort of helps, you know, dispel that problem. But I go scene by scene. I go through with the recording. I listen to the whole thing with them, but I, I give a lot of those guided listening questions as we're going. Um, because I, I want kids to have a hook, have something that's not just listening um, to deal with. So I might say, pat your knees if, or do, bounce along to the steady beat, or things like that, so that kids have an active thing to do um, with, with the storytelling. Elizabeth, sorry I have to go. I will absolutely post the book in, um, in links in just a little bit. So um, a couple other things, follow-up things you could do, other ideas, things you could do with the story when you're done. Because after those two days, I've gone through the story um, a lot of times when kids are lining up, if I have like two minutes at the end, I could say, I'm going to sing a song and I want you to raise your hand if you know who it is. And so I do, bum, 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 and I bring back those songs so that the kids then have to think, oh, these are characters from Peter and the Wolf, and each song has a character. And so I go through that that way. Um, there are some really great resources that you can find online. Um, so let me just show you just a couple of those. I went on Teachers Pay Teachers. I don't. I don't personally have something on Teachers Pay Teachers that is Peter the Wolf, but there are some really, please turn around.
And there's some really great resources on here. So I just searched Peter and the Wolf on Teachers Pay Teachers, and I found some really great things. Um, I know Shelly has Shelly at Pitch Publications has a really great bundle, and in that bundle is, I believe there's a storybook version of it. So if you don't want to buy a separate book and you want to buy this, it, it has a storybook in there. Um, Aileen Miracle set is so totally wonderful, and I have um, I have had the chance to go through and and look at that. Let me show you just a couple things that she does with that because she goes through the story and she has pictures of each of the characters. Oh, and of course my computer doesn't want to go to it. But also, um, if you look in her preview, and anytime you buy anything on Teachers Pay Teachers, look in the preview because you may find there's more to the resource than you realized, and that's awesome. So she has, um, well, and it's also a reason to buy or not. Just check the preview and see what they have in there. So she's got some worksheets. She's got information about Prokofiev if you want. I love that for a lot of different levels, she has these rhythm cards with the characters on them. She did this for the Nutcracker bundle that she made as well. Um, and so you can go through then later, you can go through rhythms. Oh, and look, there's Peter from the story. How cool is that? And kids really like that. So then you can say like, oh, we've got five more minutes. Let's do these rhythms that are Peter and the Wolf rhythms. And you can, she has a, a bulletin board set in there too. Her stuff is great. Um, but I also, there are a couple others I really wanted to highlight. Corey Bloom's set is so cool. Um, and also Tracy, uh, Tracy King, the bulletin board lady, has some really, really fantastic stuff on here. Um, but again, just like look through. Don't buy it just because... You know, but if, if you go through and you see someone like Tracy or, you know, Aileen or someone who you're like, I have bought other things by this person and I love them, well, then guess what? They probably have a great resource. But, you know, always check through the previews to see if it's included. Um, okay, so that's Teachers Pay Teachers. There's some great stuff on there. Um, but movies, I also sometimes will come back. I've got this DVD. This is a Disney thing. It's Make Mine Music. Um, and in this is Peter and the Wolf and also Casey at the Bat and the Whale who wanted to sing at the Met. And there are a couple very old, very racist cartoons that you should probably not show to students. But there are some great things in here. It's, it's really super old. I think I got this at Target in the $5 bin or in the kids section on a little end cap. Look for it. You can find it. I'm sure it's on Amazon too. Um, I also have this version. Um, and this version is animated. It has a live action component to it with Kiersey Alley and um, Lloyd Bridges and Ross Mellinger and um, a lot of people. And I've used it a couple times, um, but not a lot. So I, I really do like the Disney one the best. Um, and guess what? The Disney one goes with that Disney book that I found at a thrift store. So that's sort of cool. This one, um, it won a lot of awards. Um, I'm pretty sure it won, yeah, the Academy Award for 2007 short film. I think it's sort of terrifying. So if you're showing it to, like, fifth grade, that might be appropriate. But it is really, really fascinating um, animation. But it is also scary as heck. Like, it, look at Peter's eyes. Those are creepy. <laughs> Just, they are scary. But it is, it's worth looking through. Um, it's Magnolia Entertainment. It's, it's a sort of a cool DVD. I mean, it won the Academy Award. But again, I mean, there, sometimes there are great resources that are so cool that are not appropriate for kids. You know, so this... Um, Tread carefully. Don't just show, never show a DVD without previewing it first. Um, but if you're gonna if you're gonna go out and buy one, I would say buy this one. I love this one. And this one, um, it's really quick. It has a fun take on it. In this version, the duck doesn't get eaten because the wolf like chases her all around. The kids laugh at that. And he chases and he the duck dives into a hollow tree and he reaches in and he bites. And when he comes out, he licks his lip and feathers come off. And then later they go back to the tree and like the bird is crying or whatever and the duck comes out and the wolf just, I don't know, bit the air and thought he'd eaten a duck. It's ridiculous. But I like it because then again, the duck lives. And for first graders, that's a great thing to have happen. So these are the resources I use. I will absolutely post the link for the book. Um, check on Teachers Pay Teachers if you want. There's some really great things out there. Um, yeah, um, I can post links to the DVD. Um, if you are watching this, not if you're not watching this live, if you're watching it later um, and you have questions, post them in the comments. I um, 
be happy to go back and answer any questions or clarify things if I'm not clear or whatever. Um, yeah, post comments. Thanks for watching. Um, I hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much. Bye, guys.